to iPower Hour. My name is Tracy Sharon with the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, QI Power Hour is a free monthly webinar learning series hosted by the Health Quality Council. We bring together improvers from a variety of sectors, uh, people with an interest in improving health and an interest in learning about quality improvement related topics. I'm very happy to welcome you here today. I'm joining you from HQC's offices in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. At HQC, we also serve the entire province of Saskatchewan, which also includes lands that are parts of treaties 2, 4, 5, 8, and 10. And as many of you know, June is National Indigenous History Month. So this month, I encourage all of us, as all of us as treaty people, to learn about and celebrate Indigenous culture. And we're very grateful to have the opportunity to do just that uh, in our session today. This session will be recorded and available on our website uh, for viewing uh, after as well as are all of our past sessions. So while you're there, feel free to check out other sessions you might be interested in. And also, while you're on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter and a distribution list, and then you'll hear about all of our upcoming sessions and details on how to register straight to your inbox. We've been very excited over past years to see the growth of the QI Power Hour webinar with uh, people joining from all across Saskatchewan, all across Canada, and all around the world. So thank, thanks to all of you for spending an hour of your time with us this morning and for your commitment to ongoing learning and improvement in the systems that you're each a part of. We'd love for you to engage with the session today using the chat function. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, there's a little speech bubble uh, looking icon that you can click on uh, and share your questions, your comments, your thoughts, your ideas in the chat. Um, make sure that you send it to everyone so that we all get to see it. Um, and I'll be monitoring that throughout the session. If we have time for some Q&A or discussion at the end, I'll make sure to bring that forward. Uh, but for now, uh, if you want to give it a little practice, you can let us know who you are and where you're joining from today. So I am very thankful uh, that we all have the opportunity to learn from Dr. Willie Ermine today uh, to share with us his wisdom in creating ethical space. So Dr. Ermine is an Emeritus Professor at the First Nations University of Canada. He is from the Sturgeon Lake First Nation in North Central Saskatchewan, where he lives with his family and now works as the traditional health coordinator, including looking after the Cree medicine pharmacy of their nation. He has worked extensively with elders, learning to promote ethical practices and cultural understanding across nations. For this reason, he has a particular interest in the con conceptual development of the ethical space, a theoretical space between cultures, knowledge systems, and worldviews. So my warmest welcome to you, and uh, feel free to share with us your presentation today. <laughs> okay. You're on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I was just looking at a few of the names coming on there. Uh, who is who is joining us? So, I acknowledge all of you, wherever you are from, and uh, it's an honor for me, really, uh, to to present uh, here uh, with with the Health Quality Council. It's an honor to have been invited to present. It's always an honor. I often, you know, wonder um, what I what I can say, um, and it, it is my sincere hope that whatever I talk about uh, is is relevant, and it, but it also speaks about authenticity. I try to be authentic in my presentations, and a lot of it is, uh, you know. Uh, my my thinking, the way I perceive things, not only from the human perspective, you know, but also from the Cree cultural perspective. And as a father, as a grandfather, um, so I try to be authentic in in what I present. The you know, the evolution of my thought and where it's at. So it's always an honor to talk about really my thought. And, um, and in doing that, it, um, I am not in any way trying to impose any kind of a, a worldview on anybody. 
but to think uh, from your human, from your human interior, your your humanness, you know, to think from there about uh, what uh, the topics I talk about. I want you to think along with me, in, instead, you know, and think along with me and 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 reflect on on some of the ideas I talk about. And it's all in a sort of a language of possibility that I try to present in ideas that are that are possible, at least from my mind, my perspective, you know, these are possibilities. And a lot of it might be, in fact, uh, maybe not immediate, but that our, we hope our children, our grandchildren, can 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 make the the changes that 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 we we think about. Anyway, my topic is on uh, this ethical space, and it's uh, um, if we have the first slide. Oh, okay, the previous slide. <laughs> um, I was supposed to make the changes, right? Anyway, um, I, I call this uh, the nature of our encounters because th that is the ground zero, ground zero in terms of the experiences we have, uh, not only uh, with with our immediate family and other people, our work workspaces, um, encountering the world around us, the environment, the eco, the ecology, and, 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 and spiritually speaking as well. So it, those encounters are, you know, the, right at the forefront in terms of the kind of experience we're going to have. So I call this, uh, uh, the nature of our encounters talking about it at that, from that perspective and it that's where the ethical space really has in is influential and so that's what i want to go through so we'll we'll take it to the next slide and this as a as an educator you know education background i know at uh, educational or educational learning formulating lesson plans and so forth. You know, we are taught to provide objectives about the lesson. So in, in this presentation, this painting by um, Alan Sapp is here to show my object, objective for this lesson that we're going through here today. This is the objective, what you see in front of you. And it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it has no words. It, it almost speaks in pure emotion that we know what is happening here in this uh, painting. We can almost feel what, what the emotions are. And that has a basis. There's a grounding for the emotions that are in this painting. And, and that's where, you know, the ethical space is concerned with that our old people have taught us, for example, that, you know, we have to acknowledge we have to acknowledge the other, not, not, you know, simply because as our elders recognize, as our Cree culture recognizes that there is an entity behind this person or there is a, a, a spiritual essence that is uh, looking after this person. That's why we need to respect it. You know, we're respecting the unseen at the same time when we respect other people. So, this painting, it has, you know, says so much 
that we we all know what it's talking about and there's also that place within each of us within each of you that is the place where you love your own children you know from it comes from a certain place inside of us that place where we love our children from um and and that's starting to pinpoint you know uh, the nature of ethical space it's not a room you can rent at the headquarters of the health quality council or in a boardroom somewhere it, it's about the interior the our human interior it's it's something it's a topic that talks about that so that that is what uh, the objective is okay i will switch to the next slide and just a little bit of background about this space of encounter as i call it, the ethical space uh, it's been talked about in in different ways different authors have talked about it a lot of the um, indigenous content indigenous knowledge content will call this a sacred space you know that's that interior space that where we love our children from that's a sacred space nobody should be able to violate that it's uh no, nobody should infringe on that you know that's our own that our own makeup you know so and the middle ground richard white i think talks about the middle ground as well and and there's also uh somewhere i read about the third space and i'll present a little photo after this but the third space and and that's again all these are re relative to that ethical space i've heard somewhere also people talking about the encounter culture you know um where personalities meet where human beings meet and what happens in those encounters when people meet or worldviews meet or cultures meet so uh, again it's all part of this this idea of the ethical space um the cave i think it was um, that great philosopher correct me uh, I'm, uh, I'm thinking it's pluto that talked about the cave where we're not really sure if we're coming from the sunshine as beautiful as it as, as it is today over here beautiful sunshine lots of light and if you walked into a cave a dark cave um you know there's the light and darkness that play with each other the deeper you get into the cave and then finally at some point you're in total darkness so this uh this spectrum of light and dark you know it's uh again that's 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 re related to this idea of this of the ethical space you know and how deep do you want to go how much of it do you want to use so i guess some people have no absolutely uh, no idea how to use the ethical space if they're uh, um, either coming from racist backgrounds or or superiority intentions or anyway it's the space between you and me um i would even say it it is now in effect as i am here and you're wherever you are in your living room your office you know that um I, it, it's not restricted by uh you know distance or it's not restricted by uh a uh, computer screen you know electronics it's 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 always there because you're always there and i'm always here and the language of this space is uh, not it, it's very different than um you know voice communication and all that so next slide please um that space in between i think scientists now quantum physicists are starting to realize that you know as you look at galaxies that 
there's so much that fills that is evident in between these galaxies, even between stars, between comets, between anything, that all this darkness where we assume there's nothing there. Of course, it, there must be all kinds of dust and everything like that. But uh, in empty spaces, in space, uh, scientists are starting to find out there's that there's it has this empty space perceived empty space has so much influence and they're starting to have a hunch that it might be very influential and that's the same with this ethical space that we're talking about it it's very influential even though we think there's nothing there or there's no connection or you know there's there's so much at play okay next one um again just rel relative to the ethical space um it's it's it, it's power we if we can say its power or its influence is uh, perhaps we don't understand its total influence but we get a hunch that uh, for example how it might work we see in this flock of birds i'm not sure what kind of birds but we see that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of birds here that have singularly or become a collective uh, as if it's one. It, it's, it's only one entity. Um, you know, this all this collection of all these individuals at some point became one entity to be able to form this beautiful design. And I often wonder, well, you know, there are thousands and thousands of them. How come they're not banging into each other? Or I don't see one flying out, you know, because it's being pushed out or anything. But it's, it, it, it's a formation of a, a collective, uh, a formation of some kind of genius in oneness, you know. Um, so the, the ethical space has that kind of, uh, I, in my mind, that kind of influence that we, if we connected at a certain sacred level, a certain middle level, a certain, you know, a certain dimension of our being that we can in fact uh, become one and become as, as a collective, be able to change so much, and not only in our environment, in our society, but, you know, we, we would be able to manifest positive change in the way that we want to create our society. Okay, uh, next. So the ethical space is about how we treat, meaning in treat, we, how we interact, how we interact, you know, one-to-one -one as a group, the way we engage, you know, is it superficial or are we engaging a little bit more deeper than the super superficial levels? Like, uh, say, for example, with our spouses, you know, we engage a little bit more deeper than just the names and how we connect. And some we all know at the different times when we connect with people and when we don't connect or we get we become attractive or we become um, repulsive, you know, <laughs> but, you know, we, we all know connect, connect what connection feels like. And, and the encounter, we know we encounter, you know, there might be some people we're used to encountering as we walk into the office. Um, but nevertheless, those are still encounters. How, when we encounter another, um, a person with different body, perhaps, perhaps handicapped, um, perhaps a different culture, a different color, you know, or it, it goes beyond as well. When we encounter that dog in the back alley, you know, that, that's an encounter or, or the bear in, in the forest. That's an encounter 
or that beautiful tree you just ran into that's that's an encounter or that bug or that mosquito that landed on your wrist that's an encounter so you know encounters are are, are just so vast um but all of these things are are sentience i know you know people would say well you know how can a tree be a sentient meaning feeling and emotion and all that well that's um that's we don't have time to talk about all of that but you know in just to say that in our culture sentience is vast it 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 encompasses the human elements it also encompasses the the environment the, the ecology including the trees the bears the plants everything uh, so there's sentience there that that's the worldview and there's sentience in in super nature in, in in the spirit in the spirit world the unseen world you know the, so our teachings tell us that this sentience is is just vast and encompasses not only our world but it goes you know beyond into the universe and and so when we talk about the ethical space it's how we treat this encounter of sentience that that we experience and and essentially saying how we treat aliveness out there so that's what the ethical space uh, is concerned with okay next slide so in in the indigenous worldview, this sentience is recognized within the realms of the human nature, the ecology, spiritual supernature. So that's you know that 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 it, that is the those are the teachings. That's the worldview. That's how we operate. That's how we, that's that's uh, there's a lot of study that goes into that in our own ways. May not be academic, you know, like. But it is, uh, we have our spiritualists, we have our knowledge keepers, we have our elders, we have all, all these, you know, thinkers and philosophers that, that work on this, uh, uh, this to, to be able to say that this sentience is, is vast, okay? So we're never alone and, and it is indeed, we encounter this sentience in 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 every moment of our lives as we go forward okay next one now to give you an example a is a, a cree word so i'll give you a crash course in, in cree a is is this act you know when if if if, if i were to meet tracy I, I would say hi, Tracy, and then we would shake hands. From you know, that that is a thumb skull. That's the act we see. Uh, but if we go a little bit deeper, and 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 from from the the spiritual lenses and the worldview lenses, here's how it goes. A thumb is a root word. A T A M is a root word meaning thankfulness. Yatamihat, oh yak, yatamihat meaning you've enriched somebody and they're so grateful, you know, they're so thankful. That that's the root word. And then isko is a root word for a number of things, but it, it could be a root word for a journey, like bimisko, uh, meaning if you're sitting in a canoe paddling, you know, you're you feel that movement in the water and you're just paddling that it's it's almost it's called, almost captures that feeling that but it's of course our life journeys are much more longer and varied than just uh, simply canoeing down a lake or that word can also say having a great impact so if i kick tracy's uh, shins real hard you know i would definitely have an impact on Tracy, you know, she go limping around and so it, it, it means that kind of thing to have a great impact that uh, the presence of somebody can impact you 
you meet certain people that impact you, you know, um, and, and, and the, the actions of some people will impact you, what they do, how they acknowledge you, everything, you know, you become impacted by their actions and your words and all that. So it, it means that as well. So when we say a thumb skull, it, it, it means all those things, all those things. And in our culture, when, when we are taught about the creation narrative, for example, in the, the beginning of time for the Cree people, there's a whole narrative that covers that part where creation happens. And and then the first uh, Cree being was uh, created and what the instructions were to the original being, all that. Um, one of the things we were given as well was a language, a language to use. Who gave us that? Well, we say it's the creator. So the creator, even before we were created, was already speaking Cree. And then, and then the creator gave us the language to, to use as Cree people. Okay. And in the same way, did all these, did so with all these other cultures and languages and all so forth. So in our mind, we can say uh, this word comes from the creator, Thamsko. It's not a situation where our, our elders and knowledge keepers and spiritualists got together maybe 10,000 years ago and, and created this word. Like, um, I forgot which, uh, anyway, um, it, you know, they, they didn't sit down and said, well, this word will mean greeting and this will be the meaning of it. You know? Uh, it, it was the creator that gave us the language and therefore the word Atamsko, was spoken first by the creator. And then the magic of it is uh, the thoughts and the teachings that are embedded in the language. So when we think about instructions, when we say original instructions to the Cree people, this could be an example of an original instruction. When you meet somebody on a thumb skull. And when you encounter somebody, it's the creator's te teachings, intentions for us to enrich that life of that encounter we're having. Okay. To enrich that person that we encounter, to make them so grateful that they encountered you and, and, and to make sure that that impact it will 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 be positive and it'll grow and that those in turn will have also carry on the the real positive in fact impact of the in culture we just had so that's you know that that is an example of a teaching right and and so we'll go to the next one and again that that the, the handshake there that thumb scope and then this goes back, you know, to 1876. And you'll see the general really proud, kind of holding his heart, it look kind of looks like, I don't know. But our grandfather there is also proud, you know, uh, and they're shaking hands almost in parody in, in, in terms of um, nobody's superior in this, in, this, in this handshake, this photograph or this, depiction and I often wonder now you know after this initial meeting of, uh, of cultures you know the way history has unfolded for our people uh, I, if we had to recreate this image nowadays it, I, I'm sure it won't be that same kind of a de depiction I think uh, we know what society has done to our people. You know, I don't have to name all those things that have been in the news and have been parts of uh, royal commissions. But I think, you know, if if we were to recreate, it would almost be like our grandfather would be on his knees, almost like in a begging position. And that's what, uh, 
minds, you know, it's it's not the will of God to create that kind of society. It's not nature. It's 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 the mentality of people that draw up the rules and regulations and all that to run a society in a certain way. That they're the ones that created that that uh, inequality, you know. So, uh, Atam school on the other hand, talks about how do we enrich and then the way history has unfolded, what I call the inertia of history has really marginalized our people and, 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 and created inequality in society. So there you can see the contrast. Okay, next one. So the human experience is made up of, of encounters, as I mentioned, of experiences. We are the experiencers, you know, of, of that immediate encounter we have. And it, it is up to us if we think about a thumb school, how do we enrich other people? How do we enrich uh, the, the dog that comes into the yard? We, you know, we have a teaching in a family, for example, my great grand, my, my grandfather, whom I, who I never saw. I, I, he passed away before my time. But there's a narrative in our in our family that talks about one of his teachings, and, and his teaching goes like, if there's a dog that comes into your your yard, make sure that dog does not leave your, your yard hungry. Okay? If a dog comes in, make sure it doesn't leave hungry. And and so that's a, that's a that's a teaching that's a meaning uh, a thumb school. you enrich the life of this dog okay and so we have those teachings uh, kind of kind of hard to follow at times because here in our community we have many dogs you know if you come to sturgeon sometimes you'll see a little pack of three or four dogs well if they come in my yard well then i'd have to feed all of them and then they'll leave full but they start developing a habit of keep coming back, right? So have to feed them every day. So that's why many times you'll see us in our communities where very poor people, maybe we feed too many dogs, you know. But anyway, it, it's this idea, we can create great experience for the sentience that we encounter. We can have good impact. We can create great experience. Okay, next one. Um, so the encounter, it, 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 when we think about it, the encounter we have is an encounter of unknowns. You may think you, f you know, this person, you walk into the office and you think, you know, this person you, you've worked with for 10 years or so, maybe less, but you know, how, how deep do you know them? Is it just by name and their title? Um, every encounter we have is an unknown encounter. We don't, we don't, we're not really sure what's, what's, what's going to happen. Uh, what's, what's all within that dimension of your encounter? When, what's all possible? What's all at play? We may not know how to react in many instances, how to interact, in fact, especially so in the face of difference. How are you going to react? You know, uh, somebody uh, dressed up totally different, different color, and you encounter and, and you're supposed to associate, you know, how, how, how do you do that? If you, if you go across cultural lines into into different cultures, how how uh, how how are are you? Do you know what it is that you, that you can do or should do? How, how do you act? How do you behave in this cross cultural setting? Might be a, a an example. How, how do you react to uh, the bear you meet on a forest trail? you know, or, or the mosquito that lands on your, on your fist. So in, in all these instances of encounter, we can either be competent, we can know what to do, 
in in any any situation or we can choose or we can be incompetent and that's when our plants disintegrate you know we are either competent or incompetent it might be shades of it in between you know but uh, it, it's that encounter that's going to determine this competency or incompetency next one and the future is also an encounter it's a journey into the unknown uh, take for example we think in our minds right now that oh in the next hour you know after this talk i will be going into the office and writing up my report or something we have great plans even daily plans and monthly plans um, but that's just a mind that's just a mental exercise that we do there is no guarantee at all that what your mind is telling you is going to unfold we yeah, have there's no guarantee we'll be you know we'll be still be around in an hour's time there's no guarantee it's the future is unknown. We have not been given capacity as human beings to foresee the future. There's a lot of tools in place that can help us, uh, but it's but those kind of projections are all in a, a mental state of mind. So every encounter, indeed, is an encounter um, of, of of the future. You know. It, it, we, we, we're journeying the future is unknown it's unseen you know it, it we're, every encounter is a journey into the unknown including the person that you meet it, it, it they're full of unknown they also don't know you okay next but this encounter that we talk about, the nature of our encounters, is subjected to this invisible field of influence. Okay? It is within this invisible field that the real nature of encounters is determined, will be determined. Now, that inv invisible field of influence is your, is your interior. It's... it's it's the place where you love your children from. It's that place that is uh, your your sacred sanctuary. It's it's yours alone, nobody else's. And you put bounds. Bound, there's a boundary around you to make sure nobody touches that sacredness within you, within each of us. It is within that invisible field in the interior that that's the that's what we call the ethical space it's the in it's it's a field of influence and and it, it's that space that that uh, gives us a certain kind of drive a certain kind of energy that determines whether we are we are attractive you know there are certain days you walk down the street and everybody, you know, takes a second look towards you as your hair is flowing down. Uh, some people across the street may wave at you. Uh, you don't even know them. They, 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 people are courteous. They open you. They open the door for you, or whatever. Certain days, you're attractive, very attractive. You know, people want to. You attract good behavior goodness and all that and then but there are certain days also that become repulsive you know nobody wants to associate with you uh, your your spouse has a headache you know uh, <laughs> and then you know you, you, you just nobody nothing seems to work out for you the dog growls at you, you used to be friends with the dog it growls at you the mosquitoes attack you and just, just they take lots of blood out of you and everything happens that it, you just don't like repulsiveness. So these two, you know, kind of extremes, I guess, 
are, are largely determined by what kind of energies we 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 create, um, and 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 those energies uh, that that's the ethical space I'm talking about. And it it's full of energy, and it's 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 simply us that can turn that energy into a positive or into a negative. Okay, next. So the real nature of our encounters will be determined by that, you know. Um, we can keep it at the superficial level and say, yeah, good morning there, John. Yeah, good morning, Jane. Yeah, and then just leave it at that. There's never any substantial relationship out of that kind of uh, encounter. So the ethical space, which all of us carry around, that's our sacred space, that's our... A field of influence. That's our influential selves. That's that. That's our. Um, that's our place of uh, sanctuary. You know, all that. Um, we all have it, and that. In the encounter, these two sacred spaces can meet. And have a you know a profound dialogue or a profound effect on each other. If we open those spaces, when we if we bring that to the encounter and and use that sacred space, then it 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 becomes really influential. But lo and behold, you know that this ethical space that we talk about does not exist unless it is acknowledged that that you have your own boundaries nobody should violate and that you have been taught morals the right and the wrong uh, to know enough that you cannot violate other people's sacred spaces uh, so if we say, well, there's no such thing, it doesn't exist, you know, we're, we're all professional here. We call each other by our professional name, our titles, and, and, and you know, we have our job descriptions that prescribe exactly what to do. There's no, there's no space at work. It's all human formulation of uh, how to behave in society, how to be a you know, those teachings come come from that professional world to teach us um, how, how to behave and what kind of a human being to be. Well, so if we say it does not exist, you know, we only operate on professional levels here. Well, that's denying this capacity, right? It's a human capacity. So it, it does not exist unless it's acknowledged. And, and that space then comes to play at our crucial decision points. You know, there, there are many decisions we make in our encounters. Uh, we, 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 uh, and these decisions can be either, again, be competent or incompetent, you know. But if we have a, a good guiding system of morals and, and, and authenticity, that we should be able to make good decisions about about encounters and about how we construct our workspaces and our in fact our society so the ethical space uh, is an unseen but very influential driver it it means that each one of us carries a certain kind of influence a certain kind of power that um, that can be very effective. And imagine if we put uh, many of these together, what kind of a collective we would create to drive change that is positive. It's always positive. We're, we're, not, we're not downgrading. And, and, and it's, it's, it's that space that can create enrichment and gratitude, you know, to, for us to get out of our egotistic selves and actually see 
this encounter of the other as an opportunity for us to to move our compassion to move our our mysteriousness to you know to to use our strength so we can create enrichment and gratitude and and that's what that you know that kind of positivity possibility if it keeps growing that's that's how we create i think in my mind good societies and good communities and good workspaces and so forth okay next so kind of talked about it already but in the face of unknowns encounters um, that we're unfamiliar with we have a tendency to cling to guiding rules the policies the way things have been done and we can call this inertia this is how it was done in this country and this is how we continue to do it this is how management is done and this is the way we have to continue to do it this is the way society is created you know um, this is the policy and this is the way we continue all, all these things that have flown down through history in this country and i you know i ask you to think about the indigenous and western encounter how that has played out you know the guiding rules uh, of this country have have uh, in, in fact outlawed our ceremonies or there's so much that has been done they they have said our language our culture is all evil and and it's to be suppressed you know wiped erased out of your memory and and henceforth through residential schools now we are going to create good little Europeans out of you so that you know how to operate in society. So this is the erasure of our history and our identities, our authenticities. So when you click the guiding rules, you know, what are those rules talking about? Are they, is that, is the mentality of a superior race and uh, uh, what kind of mentality contributed towards the development of those guiding rules and policies and laws, in fact, and so that, you know, that's the stuff of reconciliation, right? So, um, and it's all these guiding rules and policies, you know, the workspaces we go into, the, it, we didn't bring any new quality to our job, you know, because all the guiding rules and policies have already, already been embedded. And so we just fill that space and we become prescribed beings to, to do what the policies and regulations tell us to do, what kind of a language to speak and how to act, budget lines and everything comes into the picture. So we, you know, this is the inertia that happens. And, but this inertia has taken away our ability to dream, to be a, an authentic human being, to think about possibilities, to be ourselves, not a a prescribed being that does what the dictates of that company or organization says to do. And it, it's, it, you know, when we are ourselves, we know our own gifts. You know your own sacred space, that place where you love your children from. You know your own dreaming, your, your visioning. Um, all the possibilities, the positive possibilities and all that. So that all that is taken away when we just follow those uh, dictates of the organization. So we, 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 we have a hard time dreaming within our workspaces. Next. So protocols are how we negotiate the interface of our encounter. What, did, what is it that we have to do? that, you know, kickstarts this encounter into a, a positive way. And, and proto so protocols are the, the way things are done according to it, to the agreements of human nature and supernature, that the actions I take not only have to be agreeable by other human beings in my community, 
but nature has to also agree with it. And, and indeed, the, the, the super nature, the, the spiritual world has to agree with it. These are the teachings that we have, that we have, that all these are part of our life and that we operate within, within its milieu, which within its, uh, within, within that world. So protocols uh, are certain actions we follow, you know, they precede us. Uh, for example, if I'm going to go out, take some medicine out, you know, from, from the land here, I have to offer tobacco to that plant and, and, and talk to it and say, you know, this is, this is as a human being, this is what I want to do. So protocols are the things that, that you put into place to, to acknowledge the encounter, to make that encounter work in the most positive way possible. Okay, next. Now, you know, let me give you a, a few of the tentative steps, for example, of when you talk about, when we talk about protocols, okay. At the Moscow, um, I just gave you that, how do we enrich others? I, I gave you that definition. But at the Moscow, and, and I wrote down, in fur trade times, Cree, the Cree people had protocols of pipe ceremony, gifting and oratory upon meeting other nations before anything else. And that's written about in, in, in explorer journals and all over uh, in history, in history books, how are people use these encounters and the first thing they would always do is have the pipe ceremony to acknowledge the spiritual nature of this encounter. So pipe ceremonies. And then people would bring gifts to the meeting and, you know, gift these other parties, these other nations or these other people or organizations and gift them to, 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 to say, you know, I come in peace, I come in good intention, and I, I am here, you know, to, to acknowledge that we can do good things. And oratory, again, uh, it's, it's always acknowledging that, uh, saying, you know, your nation is uh, created by the creator, gave you a language, gave you everything you need. And so it's the same for us. You know, so it, there's all kinds of oratory that that acknowledges the other party. And then the acknowledgement of sentience by name and presence. So um, if I called uh, Tracy, Tracy, uh, if I called you Nancy, Nancy, it's so nice working with you today. You know, thank you very much, Nancy. So that, you know, that, that's almost a violation of, of her, you know, I, I violated her because I didn't acknowledge her name, you know. Uh, so, I, you know, we, we need to call people by their names, who they really are, and, and to acknowledge their presence. Uh, it's the same with the plants. It's the same with uh, the spiritual world. We have to acknowledge the, that presence and by name. So that constitutes the way we pray, for example, to acknowledge the human, ecological, and supernature dimensions of our existence. Uh, feed the encounter. And the Haudenosaunee down east believe that Everyone is rational. And the way they pierce that rationality is by using a meal or, you know, to cook for them. So that's, you know, that's part of their, uh, their ethics, their worldview, that they believe everyone is rational. Just give them a meal and they will turn rational. Um, there was also, I remember going back, uh, Globe and Mail, and they did a survey of the top organizations. I don't know if it's just this country or, or all over, I think. 
they did a survey of these organizations and asked them, what, what's the one thing that made you a successful organization, corporation, whatever, made you very successful? And the number one answer that often came out, the number one answer was that they had a kitchen as part of their organization. They had a kitchen, you know, with the stove and the cupboard, and loaves of bread and cookies and sausage, whatever you want to have in the kitchen. It was a, a, a place of uh, refuge, right? Uh, from the work day, you come, up, come into the kitchen, a totally frame of mind, and you, you don't you don't shop talk in this kitchen. You talk about, the, oh my, you know, I want to show you pictures of my grandson who was born yesterday and you bring out your whole display of pictures. You know, this is where these things happen. And also the dreaming starts to happen. You know, I wish we had in our organization a higher quality of, of, of health care. You know, that, uh, I don't know, it's shop talk, but but it's it, the dreaming part it becomes animated so that's what this globe and mail survey found out is that the one thing that made organizations organizations very successful was a kitchen where people ate together drank coffee together and just chatted uh, orality a first nation practice of acknowledging greeting intention gratitude friendship ties upon meeting um a friendship ties, you know, uh, our people, it, uh, let me let me go back to the fur trade. You know, our people, when they went to the Hudson Bay Company, or York Factory or some other post, they would, they would um, make a friendship, not a friendship, but a, a, a relationship tie with the, whoever the clerk was the boss of these posts, the factor. And they would call him something like Nistau or my brother-in-law or, or some other relationship, you know. They made relationships like that. Um, and they would say, Nistau, my brother-in-law, you know, um, I love you so much, you know, why, why don't you, you know, back home I have a family. Nista, you know, brother, brothers-in-law, they treat their brothers-in-law in good way, in good ways, you know. So give me some extra food or something like that. You know, they, they'll use this relationship as a way to engage the heart and the soul of this other person that they want to give to you, you know, because you'd sooner give to a relative than you would a stranger. That's, that's a tactic that they used. Anyway, uh, and one of the things uh, in the context creation, shifting mind to spirit, getting out of mental cages to talk human to human. So in that kitchen, that's what would happen. Or in any context, you know, to, in order to create a good context, we, we, we shift the mind to the spiritual workings, the energy work that's happening in these encounters between people. It's getting out of those mental cages and, and uh, to be able to talk human to human, you know, not workshop like a, a director to a, a admin assistant, you know, the, the talk between those two would be so different than if they talked human to human different it's a different context uh, and and what it starts to create this di dialogue process dialogic process where you talk human to human and very often it, it means to leave out our titles you know if people are just chattering away and a director walks in and everybody everybody turns silent well that's the the titles coming into play right so leave out leave out the titles when you go walk into this kitchen. Uh, leave out the agenda. Don't you know? Don't slap on the the, the the day's agenda on the table when people are having a good time. And it's a heart to heart, human to human discussion. Um, and then the future starts to emerge. There, the dreaming that needs to happen, the visioning. 
the collective goal, all these, uh, and and how you know how the organization can can better itself. Those things are possible out of the office contexts and out of prescriptions that given to us by policies and regulations and all that. Uh, out of the inertia, the way things have been done. So human capacity is it has so much possibilities. And each one of us carries that. Each of us can be a contributor to make that experience uh, the best that it could be. What, okay, next. I think we're just about done. Uh, give me give me an indication of how much time, how much time I don't want to go overboard. I might have time for questions. And all this starts with a dream. And, and a dream really, um, you know, if you have a dream, then creativity, creation comes into the play, comes into play. Uh, we, you know, often, often we think, well, if we follow the Bible or, or creation teachings, or if we're at all in that uh, knowledgeable in that world or ha have access to that world, many times you'll hear creation happen and then creation stopped when everything was created, when we entered the scene as human beings to live in this world, you know, we're just living off creation. Well, in our teachings, we're told that no, creation started in the beginning and it kept, kept on going. Human creation happened and it kept on going until today. Each one of us has this almost this obligation or responsibility to create. We have to create. We create our children for one thing. <laughs> Uh, but so um, cre create creativity is a, is a big part of what we have to do to create not only our day, but to create the best organization we can, to create the best working conditions we can, to create the best employees as we can, and, and so forth. It goes on and on. Creativity is within our capacity, and it, it's mobilized or in uh, it, it, it's uh, triggered by this ethical space. Okay, next one. So we're, st we're starting to shut down now. Uh, value addition said uh, in a creation narrative, everybody's given compassion, you know, everybody's given mystery, everybody's given strength. Compassion is the law of the universe that everything loves us and that we have to practice that on other people as well. It takes practice. You can't just go start playing hockey without any practice. You need to skate. You need to practice so much until you become a good hockey player or a gymnast or whatever. And the mystery within each of us, again, planted within each of us by these higher being. And, you know, that's, that's why we really have a hard time understanding who we are. And it's unless we manifest that mystery in, in these encounters, you know, to, to go into the unknown. We don't know what the reaction would be. And it's that mystery that will bring out your capacity to encounter that future in a good way. You know, we don't know our own mystery until we mobilize it in some way. And the strength talks about the most powerful thing in the universe, giving us a piece of its strength to, to, to use as human beings. Uh, that strength, really, what it talks about is that we don't overpower ourselves, that our mind is not going to overpower us. You know, that we we will we'll be strong to counter these racist attitudes we might carry or superiority attitudes that we carry. We need the strength to be able to fight ourselves of those, of those uh, tendencies. Okay, next. Okay, it will. So, in in our creation narrative, we're we're told that you know the Creator gave us uh, so much, enriched us so much, all of us as human beings. We've been given. Iwio, that means to enrich. The creator did the enrichment part already for us. 
it's up to us now to enrich, pass it on, you know. Uh, but we have dreams, we have visioning, we have intuition, we have sensitivities, we have giftedness. All these that everybody carries, uh, these, these are powerful forces, you know, that we each have that and that that we can we can uh, manifest and 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 make make use not only in our daily lives but in our workspaces as well and in the encounter culture and then broadly speaking okay next one so in the pursuit of our future our minds come from a long way and my mother used to say meaning it's a Cree word to say yeah it's it's real you know the unseen world is real it it and and that we can we can use it we you know the unseen interior is real and that we can use it in fact you know we use it to love our children our grandchildren okay next one uh so we humble ourselves before the creator we acknowledge we are unable to see the future. You may think you, 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 should, you may think you do, but we are unable to see the future. We admit we are helpless without spiritual assistance. We ask the spirit beings to guide us, to show us the way. We ask the spirit beings to move the energies for us, to move things around for us so that we can be competent in this future that we are about to um, uh, entertain. So our minds tell us this is the plan. Our minds tell us this is the inertia of how it is being done. Just follow it. You don't have to think too much. Just follow the inertia. But, you know, to make, to be competent, to make that future effective, we need much more than the mind. The mind is not a good leader. It, it's supposed to be a servant for intuition, as Einstein, I think, said. But um, in, we asked us, we asked the spirit beings to move things around for us so that things will happen in a good way. And in this way, we create our days, we create the future for the sake of our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and great 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 grandchildren so forth okay anything more to be continued it'll be continued okay that's it so i hope we met the objective that we know what this uh painting by ellen sap was trying to convey that was my objective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Irvine. Um, uh, we're at just a few minutes over our time today, so there are folks who may have to, to drop off the call. I'm not sure if we'll have time for questions, but I did just want to reflect, you know, I think we're all taking away a few things uh, from what you shared today. I know I'm taking away you know, the, the reminder to ourselves that we're all human and to engage with each other as humans, you know, through our schooling or, or our workplaces or whatever, you know, we might have learned uh, different, different methods, but to remember we're all human at the core and to, to interact that way. And I, you know, you, you spoke a lot about, about um, uh, it's a competence, it's, a, it's something we have to learn with practice and by doing, you know, we're not just going to, it's not a script you can follow, it's something you have to, to do and to practice and engage in. Um, and, you know, something I, I worry about nowadays with, you know, social media and a lot of the polarized yeah. landscape we have that maybe we're not getting as much practice as we need. Um, and so to look for places in our lives where we can do that to help build our competent or competence to to engage in that way. So just a few things I'm I'm taking away from what you shared with us today. Um, I'm seeing a lot of gratitude in, in the chat as well. So just wanted to say, you know, a lot of thank yous, a lot of um, appreciating the information that you shared. Um, and I think uh, lots of folks are walking away with a lot to think about today. Um, maybe we might have time if there's, you know, one or two questions out there that folks uh, are really burning to ask. We'll just leave a minute just for that.
Yeah, I'm finding just a lot of the comments are just, um, you know, an important reminder about our approaches and our mindsets. Um, you know, being able to be vulnerable, building trust to step into that space. You know, I think that's another thing I mm -hmm. took away. This, this it takes takes work on all of our parts to build this space and to build that trust, and it's worth engaging in. All right. Well, if there's no questions from folks again, um, Dr. Mine just really want to share my gratitude on behalf of all of our our listeners today and on, on behalf of the Health Quality Council uh, for spending some time with us, uh, for sharing your wisdom and giving all of us a lot to think about. I'd encourage everyone who's listened today to take something of what you've learned um, and to try it in your interactions with folks. <laughs> Work to build those ethical spaces in, in your life. Like you said, I think we have all the tools we need. We just have to just have to engage. Um, so thank you so much again. We're really grateful to you today for spending your Absolutely. time with us. Thank you all of you for taking the time. And also, um, I hope I didn't say anything to in any way to uh, make people um, feel uneasy or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm not as ethnocentric as I sound maybe at times, but, you know, I hope the words uh, will have a, a positive carryover. And then we never know our full capacity unless we work with a few more things other than the mind, you know. So true. So thank yeah. you, all of you. Thank you very much. Um, I just did, wanted to share with folks, um, we we so, I love to hear ideas about future QI Power Hour topics from our community. And if you have something you'd like to share with the community, please do reach out to us. Um, we, we are grateful for every, every topic and every speaker that we have. Um, I did also want to share, we will be having another session at the end of this week. Uh, Dr. Ginger Reddy will be sharing with us about uh, the patient's medical home uh, concept, so we can all learn more about that. So we hope maybe that we can see you uh, this Friday as well for our next session. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Ermine. Thank you everyone for joining today and for your engagement in the session. And I wish you well until next time. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Take care, everyone.